cats had to speak up about it several times and had to even bring them comps of like, you know, if I wanted to, I could go to another church and get paid six figures. And I'm not even asking for six figures because I know you don't have it. It took me doing all that. Although you publicly praising me, I have a wealth of experience and the proof in what I could do was literally on air because I turned the team around and turned the quality of our stream around based off of what I knew I could do in, in my experience. And you were paying someone on my team and I had to ask to be paid. And that took almost a whole year before I actually started getting a stipend. Misogyny. Hola everybody, I am your host, Lucilenia. Oh, Steph. And this is Sex and Sensuality for the Churchy Podcast. <laughs> Well, we are in part two of our conversation about misogyny in the church, prompted by my announcement in last episode. If you have not watched it, go back so you can get context about me leaving my local church uh, that I've been a member of for 18 years. And simultaneously, you're going to get to know our new host, our new co-host, Steph, my brother, my friend, since almost, for almost 20 years. Uh, and so I know that you'll get to know him and love him. Um, he's going to be providing a male perspective, a Black man's perspective, who also grew up in um, different kind of churches Catholic church, black church, white church. Um, and so as well as um, he's a second generation Haitian American. So um, plenty there that you will get to know from him over the next few episodes. So let's jump right into the conversation where we left off last week. Eventually at one point in my own spiritual journey, I was like, you know what? I can't do this anymore. And I have to tell you that me leaving a, a physical church and a organized religion was very difficult because it was something that I always relied on as a medium for me when it came to God, right? I, I felt like if I, you know, if I wasn't in church, if I wasn't doing these things or on a ministry, then how am I connecting with God, right? And so in that time, since I've not been in church, um, I have realized that there are more people like me than there are churchgoers in terms of their own experiences and how they connect with God. And it has, it has humbled me um, a lot to um, think about how in some ways, maybe I made myself higher than other people or felt you know, better than other people because I had a stronger relationship to God or I had this mantle of, um, about me, which is also why um, you know, at one point I did join um, a Christian fraternity, and there are things that I enjoyed from it, I, I gained from it, um, and then there was a point where personally and spiritually, I could not continue to pretend as if all the things that they represent were now aligned with who I am now, and it's not a bad thing, I just have to be honest. And yeah. that's the one thing that, you know, I'm hoping that I've enjoyed from our conversations, even what you were talking about is you being, you're being honest and I know how hard that is and I appreciate it. And, but yeah, there's honesty is a really hard thing. Yeah. I mean, and you raise several good points, but one thing that I do want to, you know, highlight was it is hard to leave. And a lot of people who may feel like it's time to leave, whether it's, you know, organized religion or just leaving that particular church as well. Like, again, uh, other than the almost three years that I was really in, in my abusive relationship and wasn't going to church at all, 
I, you know, that's 15 years that this church and the people in this church and this this pastor and his wife and his father, who was my pastor and, and his wife and and has been a part of my life. I met the love of my life, my twin flame at this church. I have grown. I have experienced loss. I have cultivated relationships, friendships, sisterhood. You know, I have been fodder for gossip and triangulation. You know, I'm like, I've experienced so much. And like everyone else, especially, I think, very, you almost uniquely, almost uniquely to like Black churches, I think even like immigrant churches being part, growing up in in, um, Latino churches, like church is, is not just somewhere you go. It is, Mm -hmm. it is family, it is community. And so leaving that church isn't just leaving the church. It's, it's unfortunately too often it becomes you feeling or having or being disconnected from your community because too often, Mm -hmm. whether said or whether insinuated, people feel like once you leave, they can't deal with you anymore. And so, and you Mm -hmm. see that as part of your church and you know that if you leave, then you likely are going to be disconnected. Personally, I've, I've done a lot of work. I'm so good in myself. And I know that the relationships that I have, that I have, that I've cultivated in that church are real and are not dependent on that church and they will continue as they're meant to. Now, there'll be people that say they love me and and won't after I leave and that is okay that they got they have to do what they need to do and I you know if that hurts my feelings I have tools in my in my bag that will that will help me read those relationships um but I definitely and you know the other part of why it's hard is not just the community that you that you may be losing or that you know that you're going to lose but because when it comes to abusive situations relationships it's never all bad. It's mm-hmm. never all bad. That's how they keep oh, yeah, there's you definitely... in the cycle. Yeah, there's there's definitely good moments that you have with that person. And trying to figure out, well, are the good moments and the good things that we have able to trump the abuse that I'm experiencing um, and hoping that things will change and, 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 cent- and, and almost internalizing that if you don't change, then the person abusing you won't change. And that isn't necessarily the case. Um, and, I, and I have to say that even the idea or the phrase of leaving the church, it's very convoluted. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, you leave the church, you never come back ever again, you never step in one. Um, you know, what we talk about is leaving the church, but... In a, in a way that is purposeful for you and knowing that if it's a really good church, you can always go back, right? I mean, that, that that's the hope. You know, sometimes we personally have to disconnect ourselves from people, things, sometimes even opportunities, just to be able to get to a certain point within ourselves that we're happy with, Um and sometimes that includes the church. So does that mean that you leave the church forever? No. And, and even for myself, there may be a day when I find myself back in a church, you know, going, you know, consistently and so forth. But at that point, that's going to be very different from the experience that I had before because of what I've learned and grown through now. Um, and I'm looking at things through a different lens. So to those who feel... Um, in many ways pressured or reluctant, um, just pray about it. Pray about it. Think about it. Um, what's the worst thing in the world? You're going to go to hell? I don't think so. Again, that's my opinion. Um, I think that even the ideas behind that are still patriarchal in, in a way that hurts people. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about you. That's the most important thing is it's about you, your journey, and, and what you're trying to do for yourself in terms of your, uh, of your walk. Very well said. Um, every, every church is not bad. <laughs> every church no, is not bad. No, 
But as, yeah, as we're talking really about, choice. right, as we're talking about misogyny um, in religious spaces and churches, um, I want to kind of center us um, for those who may think they know or you know that you don't know. Um, while sexism, and this is coming from domesticshelters.org, while sexism is discrimination or prejudice against one's sex or a gender stereotyping, misogyny is more severe by definition. A contempt or hatred of women that often manifests itself via social exclusion, sex discrimination, hostility, patriarchy, male privilege, belittling of women, disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement, I could say the word, of women, violence against women, and sexual objectification. The way that, and this is um, Kate Mann who published a book, Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny. She says, the way I try to theorize it is, is there is this system, which I count as misogyny, that functions to police and enforce patriarchal norms and expectations. And both norms and expectations have to do with feeling as a man entitled to certain goods like sex and care and reproductive and emotional labor from women. And it makes sense that if you have those false beliefs about what women owe to men, that there would be a common phenomenon of lashing out at women who don't deliver those goods. She calls it a completely wrong-headed, but not incoherent moral system. And what do those things, what are some examples? What does that look like? It looked like paying women less than men for doing the same job. Very real example. When I took over the media team um, as a director, as someone who had uh, 13 years of experience working for major TV network and a major radio network. No one offered me any financial compensation, although someone I was managing was getting a stipend. I had to not only, I just had to speak up about it several times and had to even bring them comps of like, you know, if I wanted to, I could go to another church and get paid six figures. And I'm not even asking for six figures because I know you don't have it. It took me doing all that, although you publicly praising me, I have a wealth of experience and the proof in what I could do was literally on air because I turned the team around and turned the quality of our stream around based off of what I knew I could do in, in my experience. And you were paying someone on my team and I had to ask to be paid. And that took almost a whole year before I actually started getting a stipend. Misogyny. Judging women as good or bad based on their style of clothing or overall appearance. In the last week, I've had two leaders at this church confirm to me that they have been told and reprimanded for liking and commenting and supporting me on social media because I wear clothes that they deem as inappropriate because they're too sexy. Misogyny. A lack of diversity in genders in certain institutions, courtrooms, hospitals, universities. Talking down to someone based on assumptions about their gender. Telling single women you're not married because you don't know how to cook and clean and keep your mouth shut. Misogyny. Teaching boys at a young age to be tough and to conceal their emotions. Misogyny. We black men are the fat, one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing demographic of people who are unaliving themselves. And it's misogyny that is telling them to conceal their emotions so much that they feel that unaliving themselves is the only thing they can do to, to make it stop, to make the pain stop. Normalizing the idea that young men should be the pursuers and primary decision makers in their romantic relationships. Telling women, if you don't like men telling you what to do, you don't want to be married. Misogyny. Reinforcing aggressive male stereotypes. And misogyny, and, and 
before people come from my head. So there's misogyny and there's misogyny noir. And misogyny noir, it was created to specifically talk about the experience of misogyny, misogyny with, with black men because we also want to acknowledge that black men are also an oppressed class, hierarchy of white supremacy, and, and make space for their oppression as they also function within the system of massage of massage noir and patriarchy etc but I, that's also very key the reinforcing aggressive male stereotypes because again black men are constantly being labeled as aggressive and are being just and their murders are being justified because of their skin color because of their race no matter their age no matter their, their mental health status, they're black and they're dangerous. Black women, and, and the darker you are, there's systems in place to oppress darker skinned people because the darker you are, the more aggressive you are stereotyped to be. But then if we, if we take that mirror and we look at ourselves, how do we reinforce that, and especially that male aggression within our community? to make it seem that any man who is soft, oh, he, you start throwing out expletives and, and calling him gay. If he don't come off like big and bad and this and the other, then he ain't a man. If he not bagging bitches, he ain't a man. If you in church, it's not bad. They bagging bitches too, let's be real. Black men in church, we, we picking them up and releasing them, married or not. But for them, it's doing that in secret and having yourself a virtuous wife that listens to you, that is submissive, and that makes you a man. Misogyny. And so we have to do the work of confronting that within ourselves, but I implore you, it's not because every space you're gonna be in is perfect, but if you are in a space who can't even acknowledge and accept that we got a problem that we need to work on, it's not safe. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, how, did, how has misogyny, misogyny noir, how has that impacted you and your your community as, as Black men? What, what does that look like for you? So, well, um, I would definitely say it is from my experience, and again, it's my experience, that there is a feeling that even from when you're um, a little boy, you know, when a little boy um, may seem to have um, tendencies that they may consider to be um, feminine or, you know, or, or like a girl or whatever case may be that in terms of the language, that already begins to instill an idea that, all right, you know, I'm now associating um, things related to women, girls, um, as a weakness, right? And even the idea of crying, you know, there's a lot of men who don't cry and, and there are, you know, different reasons for that, but um, crying is a natural thing. Now, are there some times when you shouldn't cry? Sure. You know, there's a time for everything. Um, and is there times when someone can excessively cry about something? Of course. What we're talking about is just the fact of if a man goes through an experience that is heavily, uh, heavily emotional and he wants to express that, many times, you know, in our community, it was like, no, you don't, you don't cry. You just suck it up, you know? Um, and the sucking up turns into a lot of repressing of, um, your own emotions and feelings about things. And then it becomes to a point where, you know, what I've seen as well, that a man may now become like the individual who presents a certain face, but behind that face, there's somebody completely different. Um, I, 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 I 
think about the fact that there are so many different um, ways people can express themselves and be themselves, but yet when we talk about being a man, right? We it it almost um, resonates in such a way that anything outside of that definition and whatever that definition is for you, you don't fit it. Um, no matter you know how good you are, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how gifted you are, if you don't act like a man, sound like a man, um, can do the things like a man, you're not a man, or at least you're soft, right? Or simp, um, <laughs> um, as that being the new word. Um, and so, yeah, so there was a, lo a lot of times in my own experience where I just did not feel like I fit in with other guys. And there's different reasons for that for my for my upbringing, but part of it was just the fact that I never had a man who could come to me at a younger age and be able to say, "Hey, I accept you as you are." You know, I, my stepfather, who I love dearly, he's probably the only person on a handful of people as well who never looked at me as a man. He just looked at me as a son, as Steph, as a person. Um, and he never tried to push on me what his own experiences of being a man um, that he went through, which is very easy because a lot of times how, we're, uh, how we grow up and the experiences we have, a lot of times we'll bring those same experiences to our relationships, especially when it comes to children um, and so forth. So I, I would say for me, it definitely um, resonates as very constricting and and sometimes in many ways harmful to a child's development or a boy's development. But again, this doesn't mean that your, your, your son can't be tough. It doesn't mean that your son can't be, um, you know, aggressive, assertive, all those other things. Um, but the question becomes, what happens when he's not? Right. Do you now look at them differently because right. of it? And what's the impact of that? Mm -hmm. it, it creates a, I think, uh, what I see from my perspective in a lot of um, boys and men an avoidant nature to anything that isn't, um, that, that, that is, is, that isn't about power. When, when it's about power, and, and one of my sisters, um, Yvette, talked about this the other day on her page, the men do show emotion, but it's usually when it comes to power. And that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Whether it, you know, it's them winning a game or making money or exerting power over a person or your children or a career or, you know, all of those things are acceptable. But when it comes to relationship, when it comes to your own pain, that is considered weakness. And, and, and we that's see the part it. that hurts. Mm hmm because, you know, personal pet peeve in this community is how erroneous the teachings of like divine masculine and divine feminine are. Um, and one of the very, very first things that I tell people is, do I consider myself a divine feminine? Yes, I am a divine feminine woman. I lead with my feminine. And that is, that is part of me finding my balance. But that doesn't mean that I don't have masculine energy. We all have, in the polarity of, of who we are, yin and yang, you know, different cultures have different ways of representing it. I think in the Jewish culture, if you look at the Star of David, that is the perfect balance between the feminine, which is the downward triangle, and the masculine, which is the upward triangle. You know, every culture has their has their symbolism, especially ancient cultures, of what it means to be in balance of self. And so no woman, no man is void of either. It's that we live in a culture that has made the male masculine um, supreme and in its supremacy, it has become toxic. Not because masculinity or patriarchy inherently is toxic, but when you elevate mm -hmm. one over the other and you've made that singularly important in that women and femininity are only good 
for support, upbringing children, sex being had, being being considered as as um, pro- almost we, we were considered products. We're owned by mm-hmm. something or someone. We can't own ourselves. God bless <laughs> Magda Stallion and everything she's been through. I'm convinced that the reason why so many people hate her is because she owns who she is and all of who she is. She's just not a sexual woman. She's an educated woman. She's a businesswoman. She is an amazing musician who's winning awards and, and has had an amazing year musically and had the audacity to confront the person who shot her in front of it for two years. People automatically did oh. not believe her man. because she was a black woman who was embarrassed to tell people that the man who shot me was also someone I was sleeping with and y'all be embarrassed for us. And, <laughs> but y'all just don't want to believe her. And I'm convinced that a lot of that is, is she's not choosing one part of herself. She's choosing everything. You will not put her in one lane because she is not just one thing. We are not just one thing, but mm-hmm. we, we're, we're told as men, as women, you're supposed to be this singular thing because this is what we expect of you. This is what we, this is what we need from you. This is what makes me feel comfortable is you being this one thing. And when you deviate from that, when you start to bring in all of who you are and be like, no, I'm not just that one thing. You will not diminish me to being what is most comfortable for you. I will be all of it. And and knowing that sometimes being that one thing is the thing that kills us, literally. Because yeah. we find ourselves... Um, stuck or a person can find themselves stuck and not feeling like they have any other option to exercise themselves in a way that is true to them. And as a result, you know, they may, they may commit suicide or um, they may hurt themselves in a way that brings attention to the fact that there's something wrong going here. There's, there's, there's something that's happening um, that needs to be addressed. And, Too many times when it comes to black men, we're either seen as being aggressive, um, sometimes not as knowledgeable as others, sometimes even lazy. And it's, it's, it's a sad thing because those are the things that young children, young boys have to work through. You know, just even the fact that I have to have a conversation with my son about how he conducts himself um, in the street, or um, it, it, the world is a scary place, and we all know that. And no one is, regardless of what color, race you are, whatever, or gender, everyone is susceptible to the things that are out there. Now, there are some people that are more susceptible than others, and that's the part that we want to be able to address. Are in our, in our, in our communities, we know that there are a percentage of black men who on, for whatever reason, struggle mentally with their mental health. Why? Because they believe that I have to be this this husband or this father or this strong symbol of, um, of manhood. And as long as I continue to do that, I'm doing my job. But not realizing that there's a future where you can be yourself and you can thrive. Yeah. yeah. That's the hard part. But it- yeah, and but and, and and creating a space where you can even figure out who that person is outside of what we you've been told you're supposed to be, because that too often mm-hmm. we don't have those spaces. We have to create those spaces. Um, mm-hmm. But I was I was having a conversation with a beautiful black man um, a couple weeks ago who has a lot going for himself on the business. You know, as a father, and he was telling me, you know, at the end of the day, you know, as a black man. I, I know that everything falls on me. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be like, no, 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 no. But because I don't want him to believe that. But I know better than to deny his experience. I don't know what that feels like. I'm not a black man. And as, he, as we talked, I was like, I had to agree. I was like, you're right. Not because that's the way it's supposed to be. 
but because that is what the system has created. Because if you look at it, like there are more systems in place and, you know, to support women, people will, you know, but for men and black, you are literally expected to take like, maybe you'll get help, maybe not. But if it, if it don't work out, it's your fault. That's a lot of pressure. And it's a lot of pressure and, to carry every single day of your life. Yeah. You know, it keeps you in relationships and marriages and this and that, you know, it keeps you at jobs. It keeps you because it's like you don't there isn't a lot of space for black men to make mistakes. Not at all. And to feel like if I make this mistake, everything won't, 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 won't crumble around me. If I if and I, and I, I sympathize and I empathize with you all so much. Because of that, you know, and am I changing the world? Maybe, you know, time will tell. But it's why I personally, I do what I can to be who I am in the lives of the men, you know, that I'm, I have friends and uncles and family members that I'm close with, that I try to be, to give space, to even just say that. Because if not, if I would have cut him off, then I would have been proving his point. That yeah, you know, you can't even support me in being honest about my experience. So you're I'm right. Mm-hmm. There is no room for me to be human and to say, hey, I don't I don't get the support as a black man. I am expected, I have been told, I have been taught, I have been shown by the other black men in my life. We are supposed to have it all together. And if you don't, then you are not a man. And that's that. And, that, and let's not even talk about the crossroad of that with sexuality and sensuality. Like, that's a... <laughs> oh, yeah, because we're in the bedroom. Like, I tell women all the time, I'm like, if you, especially with black men, black men, I mean, black women are sexualized, but what black men are also sexualized. And black men are supposed to be king dingling in a bedroom. And it creates a, <laughs> it creates a situation where a lot of women are lazy. Because we have made them to be the sexual conquerors. And so I don't have to do nothing. You just supposed to, you came dangling. You supposed to be giving me all this pleasure. And then we walk away and be like, oh, we ain't shit. And it's like, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. Or maybe you just a lazy ass woman in bed who don't take ownership of your own body because you don't even realize how you sexualize black men to being these these purveyors of pleasure and don't realize that sensuality it, that, that is a partnership when you're talking about joining yourself with someone else or someone else's more than one we all it, it is an enjoyable experience if we all come together and contribute mm-hmm. versus literally handing over the reins to someone else unless you were the king and this is you know that kind consensual not consent you know yeah. that's a whole different conversation <laughs> but you know but but again even with that if we want since i mentioned even with that though that means there's been communication there have been things if you're doing it properly before you get in there you've already talked about what that looks like so that both of you are getting pleasure and and still you're still not you're agreeing to be to for it to be non-consensual but even in that agreement there is a partnership in how we both receive pleasure as opposed to completely giving up our sovereignty as women in the bedroom and being like, it's either, it's, it, it's him or not. And, and that, and that still goes back to, you know, expectations um, that are sometimes very unrealistic and put a lot of pressure on men because unfortunately for a lot of men, you know, if we don't have the right length or supposed right length, then we're almost not good enough, mm-hmm. right? And then we have to do almost compensate for it in other ways because we weren't blessed to have the longest in the world, right? Even though the truth is the average man has enough to please a woman. Like it's it's not you know what we see a lot of times is this um, extreme um, commercialized 
um, expectation that actually drives other industries in order to be able to make the money they want to make. So when you think about just the stuff you see in stores or um, even things that are available to men, even sexually, you know, the mm -hmm. gamut when it comes to women, it's out there. I mean, you, a woman could pretty much find anything sexually. I mean, for men, it's pretty, um, mm -hmm. in certain aspects, it's very reserved. Yeah. And that kind of tells you the expectation that someone has about what a man's sexual experience should be and what it shouldn't be. Because yeah. I've been to sex stores and some sex stores are more conservative than others, right? And, you know, one sex store may have, like, a few things on the wall, and you're like, oh, wow, I never would have thought about that. <laughs> right? And then there may be an <laughs> I know, right? Um, and then there may be another store where it's like, okay, I can't believe you don't have this. Um, and again, at the end of the day, I think what people need to get from this is that there is no right wrong um set way that you have to experience life we're not here yeah. telling you that you know um all men are, are have toxic masculinity all men feel like they have um everything on them that's not the case but there are percentages of men who do and we would be very surprised to how many of them are actually in our lives and we meet on a day-to-day -day and never given the opportunity to be able to say Listen, uh, you know, I only do this because it's expected of me. Yeah. I don't do it because I really want to. I just know that, you know, if I don't do it, then people are going to look at me differently for it. And as a result, I'm now going to be ostracized in some way. And what does that make me look like? So guess what? I'm going to give you what you need to, to see, whether it's physically, mentally, um, even spiritually, just so you can feel at ease about your life and what I should be doing for you in the box that you put me in. Yeah. So, you know, so that's the part that I, I want people to really understand is just let people be themselves. If they're crazy maniac, let them be a crazy maniac. You want to be the person who helped to support the crazy maniac, right? That's the thing that people, you, you want to be able to get the distinction from is, how much am I playing into or supporting some of the things that hurt other people versus how much am I making a space for people to be themselves and accepting? Even if, even if you disagree with the way a person may be or think about things, that's okay. We're not expecting everyone to be on the same page because that's not realistic. This world is beautiful because of the different ideas and, 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 and different ways that people see the world. What we're saying is, when you see that person who's different, give them a chance. Don't, you know, or leave them alone. give them the chance. Leave them alone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sometimes, like, yeah sometimes, even if yeah. it's fine, just leave, you can just leave it alone. <laughs> I mean, because it's like, we don't, you know, it would, but when you're saying that, it's like, we don't give room for, you know, anything that's divergent. We don't give room for exploration, experimentation. And even, like, I want to say, even worse for black men when it comes to their sexuality. It's like the moment you experiment with something and it's a little extra out there, you know, if people know, then they automatically label as you label you as that thing and want to say, nope, oh, nope, you you this because you and you may have been like, I mean, I wanted to try it, but I didn't like it. Or I did like it and it's opened up a whole new world for me. And so what? But you know, again, it is we've made these these determinations on what manliness is supposed to be. And Unfortunately, it's all. It also, you know, again, from a woman's perspective, looking at it, it's like you're supposed to know how to be that man. You, you, you know, when you're not really given room to actually grow, if you're even taught what actually being a man really truly is in a healthy way. If you had a healthy um, role model of what masculinity is, you're supposed to just know how to have sex, know how to be this man, this and the other. And if you deviate from that, then Go to hell, good riddance, you're not worth it. And if you are, then don't ever, ever, ever slip up. That is it. You you have made it and don't ever show anybody any deviance because once you take you off that pedestal, you ain't going back on there. There have been times when I've struggled with my mental health and it would lead me to a really, really dark place where I would actually picture a world where I did not exist. And realizing 
that no matter how much money I made, how many things I had, how great I was for anybody else in the world, all they would want from me is for me to be present. That's it, to be present. And I can't tell you how many times that friends or family in their own way without even realizing it have helped me to realize that the gift that I bring to people's lives and hopefully others realize this is the gift of self. That's it. You know, when you think about the person you love or care about, you know, if you remove all those things that they do, you then begin to realize, oh, I really like them because of this, because of because their personality or the way they talk or don't talk or, you know, aspects of us that we sometimes forget to communicate because we've gone into a situation where we're always talking about the, 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 the utility of what a person can do and then adding value to that, right? Mm -hmm. So... It's great, you know, it's great that you're smart, but, you know, how smart can you be if you're not, you don't have a business or, you know, you're not making a lot of money or you don't have like 10 side hustles. Um, you know, again, there's a purpose, there's a time, um, there's a place for those things and we all benefit from them. You know, so for the person who has a side hustle, I benefit. For the person who, you know, works really hard in school, we all benefit. But then at what point does that person who doesn't fit in any of those categories also benefit? Yeah. I mean, and that's so, where we start to talk about like the intersectionality of these systems, because, you know, and how, you know, capitalism starts to play a role in misogyny and toxic masculinity and white supremacy, mm -hmm. because we're capitalism tells us that it's only worth something if it makes you money or you're only worth something if you're making money. And that, and it doesn't allow you to be, so it creates a culture where we're constantly feeling like we have to prove our worth to, to ourselves, to other people, to, you know, constantly in the, in the, the bar is constantly being changed. And mm -hmm. as opposed to just being worthy and knowing what that feels like and knowing that, you know, I mean, I, again, every, everybody, if you listen to the podcast, you know, I have ADHD and I'm autistic very common for people with ADHD is that we get a lot of hobbies and we're really creative and we pick up something and we hyper focus on it and then it becomes boring to us and then we stop and I am no different um, and because I hyper focus on it I become really really good at it mm -hmm. baking was one of those things I did not grow up in a house where the women in my house were baking. So it wasn't something, it was cooking. So I never really learned to bake from my family. It was something that I started doing. I got really good at it. And because I was really good at it, everybody's like, you should turn it into a business. You should make money off this. And I did. And it was cool for a while. And turning my hobby into a business inherently sucked all of the joy out of it for me. I do my nails now. You can see, hey, um, for the people on the video, if you're not watching the video, then you can't see my nails. But I do my my own nails. These are press-ons. I enjoy doing them. I, you know, sometimes I just keep it a simple color. Sometimes I try designs. It is something that I do for me. I have had people come and tell me, hey, oh my God, this and the other, you could make that into a business. I know myself know, and now that if I turn this into a business, that'd be the quickest way to kill it. I know, and so I don't. I stay clear away from turning this into a business because I enjoy doing it for me, and it's it's just something. And I know that as a creative, in order for me to be healthy in my creativity, I need something creative that is strictly for me. That is not people, you know, obviously enjoy looking at them. They're pretty, but it doesn't matter whether they like them or not. My consumption and my joy in in doing them and having them is the only thing that matters. And again, you know, if we're talking about misogyny, like stuff like that, like there's, you know, there it's just not it's really it's not really clear. And a lot of times we don't do a good job of having these conversations because we don't make room for the nuance of things. We want things to be very black and white. And so misogyny will tell you, oh, you're a woman, you're supposed to look like this. And I, yeah, no. Or that, you know, I shouldn't wear red nails because that means that, you know, that that's be, that's known to, to be a, a siren and, and you come up really horrible connotations for women to wear red nails or red lipstick. You know, it's it sounds crazy to a lot of us, 
But for a lot of people, that's real. Like, they really believe that. Or maybe they moved on from that, but they haven't moved, continue moving forward to really start to interrogate the role that misogyny has played in our lives. I grew up in a church that was very much oppressive to women in, in the way that we dress. So the way that I dress now is a form of liberation for me. It is how I, it like, shameless, shameless plug, as I don't do shame. I'm doing, I'll be announcing a course very soon about um, healing through boudoir selfie shoots. Because that has been something that has been very, very integral to my healing journey and learning to see and being able to see myself in very vulnerable places and love myself, whether, and I'm not saying you got to post it like I do. I just think it's fun. Um, but you don't ever have to post it, but it's something that I've healed. But misogyny will tell you that a woman that dresses sexy and let alone post it on the internet is not worthy of being respected. And the devil is a whole lie. Because let me yeah, tell you, shame. let me tell you what else. Are there men out there that would disrespect me? Sure. They don't like their life. I do not entertain men who disrespect me, regardless of what I'm wearing. And because I set that boundary, let me tell you what, I am surrounded by black men and not black men who all want to have sex with me or try to get me in bed. Black men who love me and cherish me and protect me and honor me as the goddess that I am. And that's why I do this work. That's why these conversations are important because men get to be the their divine selves and they get to be emotional and and sensitive and tough and assertive and leaders and women get to be soft and feminine and and fluid and wild and assertive and angry we get to be all of those things and so we could talk forever about this. Um, to close us out, I want to share a um, something sexual celestial LLC posted on um, Facebook, actually, um, the day that we're recording. So being spiritual isn't about transcending your humanity. It's about integrating it, becoming whole. We don't avoid human emotions. We feel them and process them to gain higher awareness of self. So yes, we experience anger, sadness, jealousy, etc. We don't, we just don't become consumed by them. And we use them as indicators of something that we need to process within. That's the only difference. So if you're listening to this conversation, and again, like I mentioned earlier, what, whatever gamut of emotion that you are experiencing, whether it's about what I shared earlier um, about me leaving my church um, or whether it is in regards to the conversation uh, that I had with my um, co-host Steph about misogyny in, in our lives, in our experiences, in religious spaces, etc um use your tools if you don't know if you don't have tools then i invite you as you're feeling this take up take five minutes but if you need the timer put the timer on your on your phone for five minutes and just sit in stillness and be aware of what the feelings are, the sensations. Emotions are energy in motion. So actually locate the feeling in your body and feel it. Don't, don't think it. Don't start, by thinking at me, don't start telling stories about what it is. Just be present in your body with the feeling. And then at the end of those couple minutes, whether it's five or a couple, if you can only do a couple, that's fine label it what is the feeling is it sadness is it anger is it resentment is it disappointment or is it not one of those things and if you don't know what the word is or maybe the word that's coming to you doesn't feel accurate pull out your phone google feelings wheel and start looking at the wheel and looking at the words 
and saying, mm, no, not that. Oh, and that's it. I want and it's important. And once you've labeled the feeling, what do you need? What feel what do you need to love yourself in that moment to bring you back into alignment? If it is a negative emotion, you might be feeling like charged and excited and happy and just and motivated. Use that. Go for it. But if it's a negative emotion and to bring you back into alignment, what what is the lesson that that negative emotion is trying to teach you? What do you need to bring you back into a place of love and peace? And do that. And if any of that is to try to tell me about myself, go back to Jesus and get it because that ain't it. But if you do want to come and have a respectful conversation and you want to ask me questions, I'm an open book. I'm here. You know how to reach me. Look in the show notes. If you're a personal friend or a social media friend, you know how to reach me. Unless you come 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 sideways, we can have an adult, mature conversation. Uh, I want to thank my new co-host for jumping <laughs> right on in. And so this is probably gonna, so this is gonna be part two. Part two of <laughs> the first episode. So this will be part two. Um, if you're listening, then yeah, so this is the end of part two of our conversation on, uh, on misogyny. And I'm so excited for the journey yeah. that this is going to be for both of us and how we mm-hmm. continue to grow, how the podcast is surely going to grow and change and and, and transform and mutate or whatever it's going to be. Um, any final words that you want to share with the audience before we go? Um, first of all, Thank you so much um, because this is actually a form of healing for me. Um, And so thank you for the opportunity. And what I would like to leave the people is um, just remember that the people around you are all dealing with something. And we have an opportunity to either create a space for them to feel like they're, they're, they're supported or not. And, um, that can really make the difference for someone in terms of how they deal with it in the long term. So be good to each other. Yes. And with that, we will close the episode the <laughs> way that I always close every single episode. I love you. And remember, be as radiant as the sun. Look forward to the next episode. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. Bye.